Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is our ninth round of uh, CDC Public Health Grand Rounds, and I want to welcome everybody. And as usual, let me just say a couple of words about the rounds, which seems to me fairly repetitive, but believe it or not, after each session, I always get the same two questions. Uh, can somebody outside of CDC watch this? And is this archived somewhere? So I keep answering that question over and over. Yes, so here it is. So to welcome all of the colleagues who can watch this event outside of CDC, here is the web page where this can be watched live. We also are able to watch this through our CDC intranet and have features that allow people to email us or to provide and provide their feedback, as well as to uh, subscribe to get alerts and notes, heads up about this event. One of the things that we have done is archived everything. So if you go to the same web page, whether you are internally or externally, you will be able to see, view those events and also see the PowerPoints. And for some of the sessions, we have also archived some additional material. We continue to use these sessions for our continuing education credits, which is now, uh, uh, which started in January of this year. And the other thing that is very nice is we are synchronizing the events with our weekly science clips. And so this week, I want to thank our presenters for being the editors for selections of the topics in this week's science clips. One new thing that I would like to mention is that we will try to have each one of those sessions written up as a commentary in the MMWR. And this is an example of the very first one that we did, which was the topic of uh, tobacco control that just came out a couple of weeks ago. As you leave the auditorium, there will be copies outside on the desk if you want to take a look and see how it uh, looks. But we are planning on doing this for every single session and right now have two other topics that we just did, nanotechnology and uh, folic acid, acid fortification underway. Uh, topics that are coming up, also for those colleagues primarily internally, I get a, a lot of questions now about people wanting to be a part of the sessions. In the beginning, we kind of had to pull the whip and, and we really couldn't get people because they were just, oh, one more thing to do. It's going to take so much time and there will be 11 people in the audience. But now that we're hitting between seven and 10,000 people watching us live, and that our own director is taking you know, continuous interest in this, you know, we get emails daily, I would like to put this topic on the agenda. So right now we're booked until November, but I will be sending a call for the next group of events. Uh, if you have something that you think is so, so completely outstanding, send me a quick email so that when I send the next call, we can ask uh, for a very quick summary of what you propose to do for the director to select and, and approve. And so these are the topics that are coming up in the next few months, but like I said, we are booked until uh, November. Um, our director is not able to be with us today, but since this is something that is very important to him, we will have a few taped comments. Welcome to Public Health Grand Rounds. With an estimated 2.8 million cases annually, chlamydia is the most common notifiable infectious disease in the U.S. Chlamydia is easily detected and treated, yet not enough Americans get screened. The long-term consequences are serious, especially for women who risk pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility. As you'll see in this session, we must do more to remove barriers to screening, educate the public, especially youth, about the importance of screening and the risks of chlamydia. We must also expand use of expedited partner therapy to increase partner treatment, increase use of condoms, and promote partner reduction. Thank you. And so this, there was a Mother's Day a couple of weeks ago. It reminded me about the importance of women in our society. And as we're looking at the group of presenters today, you know, this seems like a really powerful <laughs> team. There are many women who do things in groups, but I wish, you know, these four women who will be giving presentations today are absolutely outstanding. However, I think that even more praise needs to go 
to blessed among women. <laughs> Our colleague who has endured three weeks of grueling rehearsals, practice, discussions, and elevated levels of estrogen. So I really want to, um, all of us, to give him a round of applause. So allow me just to say a few words. Um, as uh, you hear, the topic is definitely chlamydia prevention. We will have three colleagues from CDC, Sammy Gottlieb, Catherine Satterwhite, and Raul Romaguera. And then we have two colleagues outside of CDC, and, and this is very important to us, Gail Boland from California and Gail Burstein from New York. And so with that, let me transition to the first slide for our first speaker. Good morning. I'm Sammy Gottlieb, a medical epidemiologist in the Division of STD Prevention. In this talk, I'll describe the clinical features of chlamydia and risk for adverse reproductive outcomes, the national burden and associated costs of chlamydia and its sequelae, and currently recommended uh, chlamydia prevention interventions. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted infection caused by the bacterium Chlamydia trachomatis. The vast majority of infections, up to 80 to 90 percent, are asymptomatic. When symptoms do occur, lower genital tract infection can manifest as cervicitis in women and urethritis in women and men. Whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, chlamydia can ascend to the upper genital tract. In men, chlamydia can cause epididymitis, which is not thought to be an important cause of long-term sequelae. In women, upper tract infection can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. PID involves infection and inflammation of the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and adjacent tissue. Clinical diagnosis is imprecise. CDC recommends empiric treatment for PID when young women have lo lower abdominal pain with no other clear cause, and either uterine or adnexal or cervical motion tenderness. PID has multiple infectious etiologies, including chlamydia trachomatis, and the symptoms of PID can be very mild, and subclinical tubal infection and inflammation are known to occur. Chlamydia-associated tubal inflammation can result in fibrosis, scarring, and loss of tubal function, which in turn can lead to long-term sequelae, such as tubal factor infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. Tubal factor infertility is the inability to conceive due to structural or functional fallopian tube damage. Chlamydia is the leading preventable cause of tubal factor infertility. So how often do these sequelae occur? Available natural history data have limitations, but suggest that about 10 to 15 percent of untreated chlamydial infections lead to diagnosed clinical PID. Once PID occurs, 10 to 15 percent of cases lead to tubal factor infertility. This is still likely an underestimate, as untreated infection can lead to infertility through subclinical tubal inflammation, but the precise risks of this are unknown. Nucleic acid amplification tests, or NATs, are far more sensitive than older tests and are currently the preferred test technology for detection of chlamydia. Sensitivity is thought to be about 96% and specificity greater than 98%. NATs can be performed on easily collected specimens, including urine and vaginal swabs. Treatment for chlamydia is simple and efficacious. Single dose oral azithromycin can be used. I will now move on to the national burden and associated costs of chlamydia and its sequelae. Chlamydia is the most commonly reported nationally notifiable disease. Over 1.2 million cases were reported in 2008. Yet many infections are not detected, and we have estimated that 2.8 million cases occur each year. The direct medical costs of chlamydia, including costs of associated infertility, are estimated to be $678 million a year. 
Chlamydia case report rates are substantial across the states. In 2008, rates were greater than 400 per 100,000 in 22 states and the District of Columbia. Case report rates are determined by both the actual burden of disease and also the extent of chlamydia testing, which may vary by state. The burden of infection is highest among sexually active adolescents and young adults. This figure shows chlamydia prevalence by age based on nationally representative data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES. Sexually active people aged 14 to 24 have about three times the chlamydia prevalence of sexually active adults aged 25 to 39. There are also large racial disparities in chlamydial infection. Chlamydia prevalence in non-Hispanic blacks is about five and a half times the prevalence in non-Hispanic whites. Now let's just focus on sexually active females aged 14 to 24 in the US, the group currently recommended for chlamydia screening. Chlamydia prevalence is highest among 14 to 19 year old girls. Overall, 6.8% of these girls have chlamydia Prevalence is 4.4% among non-Hispanic whites and 16.2% among non-Hispanic blacks. Prevalence is lower in the 20 to 24 year old age group, although once again, differences by race are profound. Over 750,000 cases of PID are estimated to occur each year. However, the burden of chlamydia related PID is difficult to determine. PID diagnosis is subjective and nonspecific, there are multiple causes, and the proportion of cases associated with chlamydia may vary by population and over time. In older studies, about one-third of PID cases were associated with chlamydia, but this may be substantially higher now due to lower gonorrhea prevalence. Infertility is a major public health problem. In 2002, 7.4% of married women aged 15 to 44 in the U.S. were infertile. Almost one in five women aged 40 to 44 reported that they had received a medical service for infertility at some point. Chlamydia is the main preventable cause of tubal factor infertility, but the proportion of infertility that is tubal factor varies by clinical setting, ranging from 10% to 40% and may be higher among blacks. The costs of infertility are estimated to exceed $5 billion a year. Let me conclude with a brief overview of currently recommended chlamydia prevention interventions. The rationale for chlamydia prevention programs is the following. There is a high burden of primarily asymptomatic chlamydia in the U.S., especially in young women. Chlamydia is a major preventable cause of PID, infertility, and other adverse reproductive outcomes which are associated with substantial costs, and chlamydia is easily diagnosed and treated. The main goal of chlamydia prevention programs is to reduce reproductive sequelae by either treating infected women before infection progresses, secondary prevention, or by reducing transmission in the population and preventing new infections and their associated sequelae in the first place, primary prevention. In the U.S., most prevention programs are based primarily on one main intervention, screening young women for asymptomatic chlamydial infection. Currently, there are recommendations by CDC, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, and numerous medical associations to screen all sexually active females aged less than 25 annually, and to screen women aged 25 or older if they're at increased risk, such as having new or multiple sex partners. This is an A-rated recommended preventive service. Three randomized controlled trials provide evidence that chlamydia screening can reduce the incidence of PID. In a Seattle area HMO, women receiving a one-time invitation for chlamydia screening had over a 50% reduction in PID in the following year, compared with control women not invited for testing. All of these trials had limitations, but the data suggests that screening offers secondary prevention benefit to infected women, in addition to its potential role in primary prevention through, reduce, through reducing infection burden in the population. Screening women is the cornerstone of our prevention programs, but several other interventions may support or complement screening efforts. Behavioral risk reduction efforts, which can also have an impact on other STDs and unintended pregnancies. Finding and treating male sex partners of chlamydia-infected women. 
and screening women for repeat infection. To find and treat sex partners of patients with chlamydia, CDC and many medical associations endorse expedited partner therapy, or EPT. EPT involves providing prescriptions or medications to the patient to take to her partner without examining the partner first. Two randomized controlled trials provide evidence that EPT is useful in assuring partner treatment and reducing repeat infections. Current recommendations from CDC are also to, re to rescreen individuals with chlamydia three months after their initial infection. Repeat infection is common. The peak reinfection rate has been estimated to be about 20% at one year in women. In addition, repeat infections may be more harmful. PID and other sequelae are more likely after repeated infections. In summary, there is a large burden of chlamydia in the U.S., which is a major preventable cause of PID and infertility, but we have several evidence-based prevention interventions available that could reduce chlamydia-associated reproductive complications. Our next speaker, Catherine Satterwhite, will focus on how these interventions have been implemented, their impact, and strategies for the future. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Katherine Satterwhite, an epidemiologist in the Division of STD Prevention. Chlamydia screening is recommended for all sexually active females under the age of 25 years as an A-rated preventive service. It is ranked by the National Commission on Prevention Priorities as one of the 10 most beneficial and cost-effective preventive services, but also as among the most underutilized. Chlamydia screening began in the U.S. when the Infertility Prevention Project or IPP, was piloted in 1988 to detect and treat chlamydia and gonorrhea infections among young women to prevent infertility. Subsequently, chlamydia test positivity in this group declined from 11% to 5%, and screening recommendations were issued in 1993. IPP was nationally implemented by 1995. Now, this is a congressionally mandated program, and more than 3.5 million tests are reported annually. After more than 15 years of screening recommendations, how successful are chlamydia prevention programs? To evaluate impact, we look at trends in chlamydia burden and adverse outcomes. To evaluate implementation, we look primarily at screening coverage. These evaluations can shed light on important next steps and areas for program improvement. Traditionally, STD trends are monitored through case reports. Chlamydia case rates have climbed steadily over the past two decades. However, case rates may not reflect the true burden of disease. For instance, widespread screening recommendations for young women were first made in 1993. As screening became more common, more women were tested and more cases detected that may have previously gone undiagnosed. Also, expanded use of increasingly sensitive tests has enhanced case detection over time. The artifactual nature of these data is further evidenced by differences in rates by sex. Case rates are higher in women than men because of screening recommendations for women only. Clearly, national case report data are currently problematic for assessing chlamydia trends. The number of reported cases is expected to increase as more testing is done and more cases are detected. Since over 1.5 million chlamydia cases are estimated to be undiagnosed, an increase in case rates may be considered a positive measure of program impact. But, we must rely on other data sources to assess national chlamydia trends and evaluate programs. Nationally representative data from NHANES can be used. The first NHANES analysis of prevalence trends among women and men aged 14 to 39 years showed that chlamydia prevalence from 1999 to 2006 did not change significantly and may be decreasing. Another prevalence data source is the National Job Training Program serving young, high-risk women and men aged 16 to 24 years. In this population, chlamydia prevalence decreased from 2003 to 2007. The third data source is IPP. Among 15 to 24-year-old women tested in family planning clinics, positivity rates did not change from 2003 to 2007. Overall, data from these three sources suggests that chlamydia prevalence is stable or decreasing 
not increasing as case report data trends might suggest. Now, let's look at the trends in adverse outcomes of chlamydia. As Sammy explained earlier, the burden of chlamydia-related PID is difficult to determine. Nonetheless, multiple data sources suggest that PID rates have been decreasing. However, we cannot determine what proportion of these PID cases are associated with chlamydia and how that proportion might have been changing over time. No national trend data on chlamydia-associated PID exists. Likewise, infertility surveillance does not include data on chlamydia-associated infertility. Ecologic comparisons are possible, but it's hard to draw valid conclusions given that PID and infertility have multiple causes. Overall, no chlamydia-specific data are available to monitor adverse outcomes, limiting our ability to assess the impact of prevention efforts. Clearly, we need strategies to improve measurement of trends in burden and adverse outcomes. To do that, we are monitoring chlamydia among pregnant women to minimize the impact of healthcare-seeking behaviors, piloting implementation of a Medicaid Sentinel system to include access to real-time chlamydia testing and adverse outcomes data, and collaborating to develop improved methodologies to measure trends. CDC is also developing a national action plan for the prevention, detection, and management of infertility with an emphasis on improving infertility surveillance. So, how successful are programs in reducing disease burden? Chlamydia prevalence is stable or decreasing. Data suggest overall decreases in PID. Even with limitations, these are both signs that prevention programs are having some impact. However, chlamydia prevalence is extremely high in young black women, and programs need to consider how best to reach this population. Overall, evidence suggests that current chlamydia prevention programs are having some impact, but not enough. What about the success of programs in the implementation of prevention interventions, primarily screening? Measuring program implementation is also challenging. Chlamydia screening coverage has been estimated using the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set, or HEDIS. HEDIS consists of a set of performance measurements used to assess the quality of care in managed care organizations. A chlamydia screening measure was implemented in 2000, capturing the proportion of eligible women enrolled in the health plan who were tested for chlamydia within the calendar year. Here are trends in chlamydia screening coverage among young women as reported through HEDIS. While it increased from 2000 to 2008, coverage is still low. In 2008, screening coverage among women with commercial health care plans was only about 43%. In the Medicaid population, coverage has consistently been higher, reaching about 55% in 2008. Our best estimates of screening coverage from HEDIS only provide inf information on coverage among healthcare seeking populations, not for population based screening. CDC funded eight projects in 2009 to develop approaches to estimate community levels of screening coverage using existing data sources. Defining baseline coverage is critical for any future intervention strategy research. The frequency of screening also plays a role in determining screening coverage. While annual screening is recommended, data suggests that very few women are actually screened annually. Defining the denominator for calculating screening coverage relies on a determination of sexual activity, which is not always captured. So, how successful are chlamydia prevention programs in implementing interventions? Screening coverage among the healthcare-seeking population is less than 50%, but improvements are being made. A significant limitation is that no national data are available to evaluate other interventions, such as rates of partner treatment and rescreening rates. Given what I've discussed so far, what are the next steps in terms of areas for program improvement? What is the best strategy for reducing disease burden? Should we focus our efforts primarily on increasing screening coverage? This could be done broadly or in a targeted fashion to reach high-risk populations. For example, venue-based screening in jails or schools. Or should we increase use of other interventions? If a combined approach is best, how should we allocate resources? In a setting of limited resources, what about men? Screening asymptomatic men does not offer them any substantial secondary prevention. Also, men are difficult to reach due to limited health care seeking. Men with the highest risk are partners of chlamydia-infected women. Partner treatment interventions can target this group of men. 
We have begun to use mathematical modeling to determine the best strategy for chlamydia prevention. Preliminary results suggest that using a combination of interventions may be effective, such as increasing screening of young, sexually active women and increasing partner treatment efforts. Routine male screening had only a limited impact on prevalence among women when screening for women was already established. Partner treatment interrupts transmission. This is the only modeled intervention to also reduce repeat infection rates. Therefore, this suggests that partner treatment is an essential component of chlamydia prevention. Next steps include the expansion of existing interventions. As I discussed, improving the measurement of program impact and implementation is important. More research to determine the optimal program structure is necessary. In addition to modeling, better data are needed on chlamydia natural history. A special issue of JID was published online this week exploring these issues. Practice-based evidence is critical, including local assessments before and after implementing chlamydia interventions. Ideally, we need large-scale community demonstration trials to assess prevention interventions. I would now like to introduce Dr. Raul Ramaguerra, who will be discussing broader societal and public health challenges in chlamydia prevention. Good morning. I'm Raul Ramaguerra, National Chlamydia Screening Coordinator in the Division of STD Prevention. I will discuss health system issues and societal and individual challenges that affect the overall effectiveness of our prevention program. Various studies have documented that having insurance is associated with increased utilization. Young adults remain the largest group without insurance coverage in the United States. Uninsured women in this age group are less likely to have a healthcare visit during the previous year, and when they access healthcare services, they may be less likely to pay if offered a chlamydia test. Health reform will increase access for a significant proportion of those targeted by our program, allowing us to focus on other factors that influence utilization of preventive services. Some of these factors include the availability of providers and their willingness to screen, insurance coverage of preventive services, and whether the patient agrees to receive services based on their perception of risk to any additional co-payments required by their health plan or they experience difficulty accessing confidential sexual health care services. Adolescents are more likely to have access to health insurance. However, there are more services recommended for adolescents than for any other age group, but not all are science-based. Every day, providers make difficult choices regarding which clinical preventive services to offer during a brief healthcare visit. Novel service delivery models are needed to assist providers incorporate preventive services into adolescent healthcare visits. The large number of recommended preventive services for adolescents is in contrast with the few preventive care visits by Medicaid and privately insured adolescents. Let's look at Medicaid. Under federal law, state Medicaid programs generally must cover the early periodic screening, diagnostic and treatment benefits, or EPSDT, for children and adolescents under age 19. Yet, only 46 to 60 percent of Medicaid-eligible adolescents receive a well-child checkup during a two-year period from 2003 to 2006. In a study of high and low-performing plans, a few important issues emerge. High deductibles and co-pays are a significant barrier for most patients offer a chlamydia test. What the plans do to influence provider behaviors may not be as important as what becomes standard of practice in the community. Accordingly, a more effective strategy to change provider behaviors may be to increase public awareness and demand. Plan managers also believe that more is needed to increase employers' interest in covering chlamydia screening. Among societal and individual challenges that may impact chlamydia screening coverage, let's first consider physicians' attitudes and practices. In a study of primary care physicians, only six in 10 physicians answer correctly 75% or more of the questions representing common STD scenarios. Physicians also attribute low screening to other factors, such as the lack of information about disease rates in their community and the belief that their patients are not at risk. The new health reform law includes various provisions that increase access to insurance and clinical preventive services. For example, it expands insurance access for young adults and eliminates co-payments for clinical preventive services. It creates new incentives 
to boost the adoption of electronic health records and increases emphasis on quality of care. These are important provisions because they expand access and coverage of chlamydia screening for persons that were previously uninsured and improve our ability to monitor screening coverage. A major societal challenge is stigma. Individuals may be reluctant to seek STD services because of shame or fear. The society as a whole, including politicians, may be reluctant to advocate or support STD prevention programs. Consequently, it is hard to find champions or advocates for STD services. To reduce stigma, CDC is working with partners to make chlamydia screening a routine part of care. At the individual level, one of our main challenges is the limited knowledge about STDs and infertility and the low perception of risk among adolescent females. To address stigma and the lack of information about chlamydia and other STDs, CDC and its partners are in the second year of a national campaign known as GYT or Get Yourself Tested, which has expanded its message this year to include another message, Get Yourself Talking. The goal is to increase awareness about STDs among adolescents and young adults and to normalize conversations about STD prevention and sexual health. The campaign has many components, including tips on ways to generate a conversation about STD testing with healthcare providers and with sex partners. This map shows locations of clinics, health centers, and community organizations that have requested GYT kits as of April 2010. CDC is working with the Council of State Governments to address some of these challenges. The Council developed a legislative policy brief on chlamydia screening and treatment that includes various examples of state initiatives, such as laws in support of EPT, screening women seeking a pregnancy test, and requiring insurance coverage of annual chlamydia screening. CDC is also working with other organizations to assess chlamydia screening coverage and develop new quality measures to expand access to screening for low-income and minority populations, and to develop tools and resources for clinicians. Our next speaker is Dr. Gail Bolan from the California Department of Public Health. Good morning. I am Gail Bolan, Chief of the STD Control Branch at the California Department of Public Health. I will be discussing the implementation of a chlamydia prevention program at the state level and share with you our California experience. In 1997, it was known that chlamydia was the most common communicable disease reported and a significant public health problem in California. Over 75% of cases were seen in the private sector, and public and private health providers focused on developing a statewide chlamydia prevention plan. In 1998, the California Chlamydia Action Coalition was formed to develop a chlamydia prevention program framework. Today, I will describe some of our successes as well as some remaining challenges and opportunities. The coalition is a statewide public-private partnership initially funded by the California Healthcare Foundation. Members include many key stakeholders from both public health and private medical sectors as listed here. The coalition developed a chlamydia prevention program framework. Four strategic goals and specific action steps were endorsed by the stakeholders, and they were to increase access to screening, to increase partner treatment, to promote awareness among providers, policymakers, and the public, and to enhance health information systems. To achieve the first two goals, we found that clinicians needed tools, training, and technical assistance. A chlamydia care quality improvement toolbox was developed for health plans, medical groups, and provider organizations. It included a collection of resources to educate providers and patients about chlamydia, and practice guidelines to promote compliance with chlamydia screening, treatment, partner management, retesting, and reporting. The chlamydia prevention program has seen improvement in, its strategic, in three of its strategic goals over the past decade in screening, partner management, and awareness. Let's look at some of these areas in more detail. We have been monitoring chlamydia screening coverage of young females in four settings in California, in the California Medicaid program, in Kaiser Permanente Northern California, a health maintenance organization, Family PAC, which is our California family planning program, 
and juvenile justice facilities. Overall, we have found that since, 19, 2000, since 2004, the average screening coverage in California is above the national rate in all settings. Let's now look specifically at the annual volume of tests and cost of screening in our Family PAC program. The Family PAC program provides comprehensive reproductive health services, including STD screening and treatment, to women and men. And in fiscal year 07-08, over 1 million women were screened at the cost of approximately $40 million. Two important points should be noted here. One, the cost of screening is high because our state reimburses laboratories at 80% of the maximum allowable Medicaid rate, which is $48.50 per test significantly more than the actual cost. And two, California only receives three million in federal STD appropriations for chlamydia screening. If we had not leveraged the healthcare system, less than 80,000 females would have been screened annually. The second area of progress is partner treatment, including expedited partner therapy, which was allowable in California in 2001. The legislation was proposed by healthcare organizations is they recognized they had no mechanism to easily treat partners who were outside of their health plan. The legislation set forth exceptions to laws in California that require an examination before prescribing. Prior to 2001, traditional partner referral was the method commonly used for par partner treatment. Traditional partner referral is where the patient attempts to inform the partner about the need for treatment, and then it's up to the partner to access treatment on their own. Health department follow-up of partners was rare because of low staffing levels and very large number of cases. Oops, seem to have gotten ahead of ourselves here. Since the legislation of EPT, we have been monitoring provider barriers for EPT usage. In a survey of physician and nurse practitioners, we found that the three most common barriers were concerns that EPT results in incomplete care of partners, that it's dangerous without knowing the partner's medical or allergy history, and that the practice will not be reimbursed. About 35% of physicians and 25% of nurse practitioners were concerned about being sued, and just over 20% thought that EPT should only be given if the partner's name is given. In an assessment of partner management strategies offered to women treated for chlamydia and family planning clinics, we found that the most common strategy offered, as reported by the woman, was traditional partner referral. EPT was offered to 17% of these women, and a concurrent patient and partner treatment visit, also known as bring in your own partner, BYOP, was also offered to 17% of women. Overall, these women reported that 51% of their male partners received treatment. Yet there was a notable, noticeable difference of completion of treatment by strategy. 80% of the women offered EPT reported that their partners received treatment. Similarly, 78% of partners who planned to bring their partner with them to the clinic for treatment, BYOP, reported that their partners were treated. But less than half of partners were treated when the patient was offered traditional partner referral counseling. The third area of our progress was an increasing awareness about chlamydia infections and their complications at the community level. There are numerous activities and programs, and some are listed here. They range from establishing partnerships with youth serving agencies, to improving existing collaborations, to developing specific marketing projects. Here is an example. We've developed medically accurate STD curriculum for high schools and middle schools to integrate into state mandated AIDS curriculum and we offered teachers trainings throughout the state. Previously, many teachers found their STD HIV content on the internet and were not aware of any existing medically accurate curriculum. We recently conducted a skill assessment of community educators serving over 200,000 youth in California who had received resources and training in STD prevention education through the coalition efforts. Over 60% reported being more confident in explaining STDs and in youth facilitation and over 50% were more confident in discussing racial disparities and in understanding youth rights. California has made great progress in three of our strategic goals. However, challenges at the state and local level remain, such as high Medicaid reimbursement rates for NAT screening tests, making chlamydia screening costly. No federal reimbursement for EPT limits uptake for this important strategy. 
competing priorities like obesity, and the declining public health infrastructure. Thank you, and our next speaker is Dr. Gail Bernstein, who will discuss how partners outside of CDC are addressing these and additional challenges. Good morning. I'm Gail Burstein, a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine at the University of Buffalo in New York. I'm a member of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, whoops, and um, where I'm the organization's National Chlamydia Coalition representative. Many outside of CDC also believe that chlamydia prevention is a very important health intervention, and I will describe how CDC partners are addressing some of the prevention challenges discussed so far. Unfortunately, many providers do not consistently take a sexual history and offer chlamydia screening. The coalition and other partners are addressing this challenge through a multi-strategic approach, including training, endorsing screening by professional medical associations, developing tools to facilitate office-based screening, disseminating information through lectures, articles, and webinars, and by promoting quality measures to improve the care of adolescents. For example, the coalition successfully advocated for a new chlamydia screening measure for the accreditation of commercial and Medicaid plans that will take effect this summer. The coalition has recently developed a collection of chlamydia and STD resources for healthcare providers. This document contains information on continuing medical education and other learning opportunities, slide sets and teaching materials, patient education materials, clinical practice tools, and resources for policymakers. And then this provider chlamydia screening implementation guide identifies and offers recommendations to address all barriers to providing confidential adolescent chlamydia screening in an office-based setting. Although all 50 states and the District of Columbia currently allow minors to consent for STD diagnosis and treatment, Maintaining confidentiality in the billing and insurance claims process is challenging. Many commercial health plans routinely send to the primary insured, which is usually the parent or guardian, billing statements called Explanation of Benefits, or EOBs, that list all billed services. Hence, an EOB may actually disclose confidential services. Also, clinical laboratories also send their own billing statements, including chlamydia testing to the primary insured. The American Academy of Pediatrics and Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine had developed tools regarding coding and billing to maximize providers' reimbursement while minimizing potential disclosure. AAP and SAM offer more tools to improving confidential service delivery, including guidance on how to perform an atraumatic parentectomy, which means gently asking the parent to leave the room for private time with the adolescent and confidential screening questionnaires. They are partnering with the Center for the Adolescent Health and the Law to address disclosure of confidential services through health plan billing statements. The first meeting is actually today in Washington, D.C. On the state level, the AAP New York State Chapter and CDC's Infertility Prevention Project are addressing the conflicts in New York State laws that on the one hand provide minors the right to consent for their own confidential STD care and contradicting laws that actually mandate disclosure of services through billing statements sent directly to the primary insured. The partners are also working on legal barriers and addressing providers' concern for the implementation of expedited partner therapy. In 2009, SAM and AAP published a joint position paper endorsing EPT to heighten community providers' acceptance. Efforts are underway to develop tools to assist states interested in removing legal and health systems barriers. In New York State, New York State, AAP, SAM, and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology chapters worked with the New York State Department of Health to develop EPT regulations that were acceptable to community providers. Next is development of a collaborative EPT training and information dissemination plan. To succeed in widespread EPT use, Healthcare organizations must urge CMS and HRSA to ensure coverage of the partner's antibiotics for EPT, where EPT is legal. These EPT advocacy efforts have been successful across the United States. 
Shown in dark green are the 12 states where EPT was legal in 2006, compared to the 24 states and one city in 2010. The coalition is working with CDC and national partners to address chlamydia health disparities. For example, the coalition's member organizations include groups that represent persons of color, women, and youth, and 10 small grants were recently awarded for the development of community-level prevention approaches in areas with disproportionate burden. In summary, there is a large burden of chlamydia, a major preventable cause of infertility in the United States. We have effective prevention interventions, but they are underutilized. Prevention programs are having some impact, but we need to do better by increasing screening, partner treatment and awareness, reaching disproportionately affected populations, and improving measurement of program implementation and outcomes. There are many challenges, but there are also opportunities for improvement. We have enthusiastic community partners like me who are eager to promote chlamydia screening, and, prog and progress has been made in addressing several public health, societal, and individual challenges. And with healthcare reform, we also have the opportunity for engagement in ev evolving healthcare delivery systems to jointly address barriers at federal, state, and local levels. Thank you. We're now going to open the floor for questions. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask a question about uh, the speaker commented on uh, screening men and uh, impact, uh, the perceived impact or minimal impact on, on women. And uh, uh, m my point is that if the screening uptake is low, I suspect there would be a greater impact by screening, generally screening of uh, uh, younger men. And I, I was wondering if anybody is aware of any uh, incremental cost effectiveness data or any effectiveness data. I don't know whether U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is currently examining that or if, if there is insufficient evidence. This is uh, the first part of my question. The second part has to do with uh, frequency of screening. Um, uh, a speaker commented that maybe something like 20% of cases would be interval occurrences, namely uh, uh, disease occurring between uh, uh, one year time window. And I'm, I'm also wondering whether if there are data supporting more frequent screening like every once every six months, whether that would be in terms of cost effectiveness or incremental cost effectiveness would be a, a way to go. Thank you. I'm going to take the first part of your question and have Sammy take the second. Um, the first part of your question had to do with the evidence to screen men. Um, there was a male screening consultation that was held at CDC several years ago that reviewed some evidence. Um, and there's really not a lot of evidence for routine male screening because of some of the issues that I outlined, including the fact that men don't seek health care very frequently. Um, however, this is an important question that CDC is trying to address. And there have actually been some natural experiments, some cities that have chosen to try to screen more men. And there's been mixed results on the impact on women. Modeling work shows that there's just not a lot, of added, a lot of added value. And what we currently think is that women, you need to work on screening women first. And if we ever got to the point where we were doing a really good job screening women and resources permitted, screening men might be the next logical step. So the short answer, we're, looking, we're doing a lot more research and there's a lot we don't know. Um, I'll respond to the question about frequency of screening. And you bring up a very good point. Um, we know that women with one chlamydial infection are at high risk for getting another infection in the future. Repeat infection is common in the months after um, one chlamydial infection. And we also have found in studies that have looked at um, 
PID um, incidents that a lot of PID um, cases are detected um, where people were screened for chlamydia at baseline and then PID in the following year was related to incident chlamydial infection. Um, the question is though, we, we don't have great data about what are the best strategies um, in terms of whether it's better to broadly um, increase screening coverage of, of all women. And certainly we have recommendations to rescreen women with one infection. That is, is um, very important. Um, and increasing partner treatment to prevent those repeat infections. But we need to have a better understanding of how frequently um, to screen. And we'd like to have some um, actual research on the frequency of screening efforts um, and the impact on adverse reproductive outcomes. You also ask whether the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has reviewed the evidence for male screening, and they found inconclusive evidence that we should be focusing on males at this point. I just about accessibility or doing the testing on the part of males. That could, if proven effective, that could be part of the annual exam. I mean, getting a urine sample and doing it with the other okay. is not an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over here on the left. Uh, good morning. Jeremy Sobel, Office, uh, Center for Global Health. Uh, several of you alluded to venue-specific testing. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. I mean, uh, African-American females age 14 to 19 sounds pretty much like the urban high school population, and that would seem like a very... Uh, useful place to try to conduct regular routine screenings, and I'm sure that that's been tested, but wondering if you could comment on that. Also, whether you've um, been able to speak with people in the military public health system where there's a large population under very intensive surveillance for STDs, and whether they may have some of the answers about the relationship between uh, infection and uh, PID. Okay, so the first part of your question um, Venue-based screening, there actually are several cities who are actively screening in um, urban high schools, and they are finding a huge burden of disease. So I think that that's a very effective strategy for um, screening young women, and you, you do find really high-risk women. From a national perspective, it's hard to say that because there are, it's that there are a variety of school types with different populations, so not necessarily does every school have high prevalence, but it is a, a good strategy that many cities and local areas are pursuing. I'm going to let you answer the military. Yes, we have had conversations with the Department of Defense regarding screening um, some of the young recruits. They have different policies in the different components of the military, and some evidence suggests that those that are screening bef when they're recruiting them actually have lower uh, incidence of PID than those that are recruiting later on. So there is some evidence. However, we have inconsistent policies, and one of the issues that, that they're having is that they cannot cover treatment of partners if the partner is not also a member of the military. Um, I just want to add to that. There was one um, cohort study done in the military system where they had a program where they were screening women for chlamydia on Sundays at basic training intake and not screening women on other days. And they uh, looked um, forward in time to assess um, rates of hospitalized PID. And in, in rates of hospitalized PID or ectopic pregnancy, they did not find any differences in that program. Unfortunately, they didn't have any outpatient um, data uh, in that study. And we know now that, that the vast majority of those um, cases are seen in the outpatient setting. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Gieser. I work at CDC in the Occupational Health Clinic. I'm practicing physician. And I worked for two years at um, Emory Student Health Clinic, where we were frontline for STD screening. So just a, a couple notes from the trenches, so you guys know what's a little bit. Um, we, we do have men coming in asking for full STD evaluations, mostly in the setting they want to be tested for HIV. So they're asking for everything. So that's great. But that's in a special setting where we have free, free help services for these folks. Um, we're, we're doing a good job in the setting of women coming to us for annual exams of doing a chlamydia screening. We don't do it when people come in for a sore throat. We don't do it when people come in for ankle sprains. And most young people in the community are only coming to seek health care 
for acute illnesses or injuries. Part of the problem, in my opinion, is I think that I think the U.S. Preventive Task Force is sending two different messages. Over the years, we've been sending the message, you don't need to have an annual exam. It's not resource effective. There's no reason for a male to get an annual exam, ever, according to maybe once at 20 to get a screening cholesterol. I, don't, I think that it's not recommended. For women with liquid-based um, PAP screening, the, the United States Public Task Health Task Force has also decreased the uh, recommendations for uh, frequency of, of those visits. And really, it is, it is the incredible success of the public health system in getting the message to women, you need an annual PAP which has been the driving force, I think, for getting women in to see, particularly obstetricians, annually. <laughs> when we start saying, okay, you only need an annual PAP for three normals, and then you can go every three years, we're, we're actually giving the message to not seek annual screening for vaccinations like Gardasil and for screening. It's a really lost opportunity. How, what are you guys doing to look at, at these? issues. Um, I agree with all your points that, you know, if we just focus on, quote, the annual checkup, we're going to miss a lot of opportunities for screening. The huge advantage we now have with the NAT tests is that these tests can be done by the patient with a self-collected vaginal swab or with a urine sample in a male. So we don't need clinicians to be examining patients to screen. And so I think the message that we are trying to get out and how we've been working in California is really look at any opportunity. In, have your registration clerks know when a young person comes in and encourage them to be offering the screening. So I think we're looking at all types of visits. Um, and anytime someone enters even you know, emergency departments, uh, we think there's opportunity. So I agree with you that we've got to kind of change the message. And, and also young women need to know, like they have known for pap smear screening, they need to now start thinking, no, if I'm sexually active, I got to go in and get that chlamydia test once a year. So I think we've got to work on all levels, both providers and at the patient level. Hi, and if I may add, um, for, for adolescents, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has published a Bright Futures, which is a recommendations for preventive health care um, from birth through the age of 21. And in those recommendations are annual testing or a as annual visits for adolescents through the age of 21. And if they're sexually active, part of that is a gonorrhea chlamydia test. However, um, we don't have to do a public exam, as uh, Dr. Bolin um, reinforced, that we can do a non-invasive test with a urine test or females with a self-collected vaginal swab. And I just have one more comment. There is also re research going on to, as to other ways to test. There's, um, there's home-based screening that's being pursued where you can go online and request a test to be mailed to your house, collect your own self-vaginal swab, and send it back in. So I think that there is there's research undergoing on, underway to address some of those issues. I, th I think that's great. Those are all good points. I do think that um, I, think, I, think, I think making sure the problem, the other issue is if, if, we, if it's not in pediatrics, it is endorsed by the Academy of Pediatrics to have annual screen, annual well child ex things, um, exams, so it's paid for by insurance. To the extent that it's no longer recommended to have annual exams of any kind for, for young women and men, it becomes an insurance coverage issue as well. I think to the extent that we um, target our advertising to the women themselves, also target maybe in medical journals to physicians because internists are not trained in adolescent medicine. They're busy with diabetes, coronary artery disease, stroke, and, I, and we are undereducated in this area. So I, I'm really glad that there's some, that we're doing s things to educate young people, giving them other venues for testing. So yeah. thanks. We appreciate your comments. I, I think there's also an expansion of school-based clinics that is also part of health reform, and we're trying to coordinate with that. And as part of that, some, some jurisdictions are actually examining the, the possibility of doing chlamydia screening during sports examinations or sports physicals. And this will be our last question. Uh, my name is Joseph. Uh, I'm at CDC here. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm not sure whether some of you are aware of uh, the study from Canada, uh, British Columbia, that uh, indicates that 
screening and treatment actually over the years resulted in greater susceptibility to reinfection. And so uh, the benefit of over 10 years of screening was actually uh, making people more susceptible to chlamydia infection. And the new strategy appeared to be that there should be an emphasis on a prevention such as a vaccine. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, what Joseph is bringing up is there's been a hypothesis by Bob Brenham and Mike Ricard in um, Canada who have um, looked at increasing case rates, as Catherine showed, in, in the setting of ongoing um, chlamydia prevention programs and have, have postulated that shortening the average duration of infection um, with our screening and treatment programs may be impacting um, protective immunity against um, future chlamydial infections, increasing repeat infections. And so um, this is a very um, interesting hypothesis, and we've seen that there are artifacts in the surveillance data, and so it, it may just be an artifact of increased um, screening coverage and increased detection that we're seeing these rising case rates in the setting of ongoing um, chlamydia prevention and control programs. But it brings up a very interesting point about the intersection between our control um, and prevention programs and the natural history and immunobiology of um, chlamydia infection. There is um, clear evidence in animal models, for example, that there's partial protective immunity to chlamydia that develops. Um, that is, uh, um, the animals are not um, protected fully against getting chlamydia, but when they do, the infections are shorter and um, have lower organism loads. And so we have some evidence to suggest that that also occurs in um, humans. And so um, as part of the chlamydia immunology meeting that Catherine referred to and um, the supplement in JID that came out this week, these are the kinds of things that are being explored to really try and push for getting better research on the immunobiology and natural history of chlamydia infection and understanding how that might intersect with our programs to, to optimally structure our programs in the future. And that will conclude our session today. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all for discussion. See you in four weeks. <laughs>